guess we are ready to start. Um, Jan is unfortunately still compiling the demo, uh, which we'll see later in the presentation, so he'll be um, in, in, in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, I'll carve for him for, uh, uh, till that time. Um, I'm Robert Varga. Um, some of you may know me um, as the uh, PTL of Yang Tools and um, a, a vocal guy on the mailing list. Um, uh, and I'll update you what we've done in Boron and what the, the plans around while well, clustering MDSAL, the overall architecture, and wh where is it that we want to take um, um, open daylight infrastructure in, in the coming releases. Um, feel free to jump in at, at, at any time with any questions. We've got plenty of time. A couple of slides may be too little, so uh, w we have plenty of time for questions. Um, so I'll start off with a bit, bit of architecture. Um, essentially, what, what does really make Open Daylight different? Um, I, I guess you've seen this, this uh, slide a couple of times before. Essentially, usually what you get from a controller is some sort of a service abstraction layer which really defines the APIs for southbound plugins and, and northbound plugins and then um, applications really and what, what sort of northbound APIs are exposed. Um, as it turns out, usually when you start off with this sort of um, uh, abstraction, the, the, the architectural bottom, um, bottleneck becomes the uh, SAL um, because it has to define the normalized um, data model and the model of interactions for to cover all those different network elements, all those different protocol plugins, and then give services to all those applications and what have you. Um, this is something that we realized early on when we started doing Open Daylight, um, and we kind of evolved it to uh, a, a different architecture where really the uh, service abstraction is, lies really with, with the applications and with the plugins and the model driven install really just provides the plumbing where, where you can um, pull your, your individual plugins and based on the data models um, and, and the interactions they model you can kind of integrate the system so, so you can have uh, really um, parts of the controller which solve a particular function and you can have, uh, and you can have uh, the, these kind of islands, right? So I don't have to define um, in, in the core what is it that OpenFlow can do, what is it that NetConf can do, what is it that BGP does. I don't have to uh, abstract it out to, well, what, what really is the service? But I can rather define the data model for, for that particular problem domain. And then the individual plugins, be it southbound protocols, be it applications, be it whatever really service it is, um, use that. Um, of the, sorry. Um, and, and the SAL really provides just uh, the means to communicate, which are um, three thing, uh, things really. The concept of a, of a data store, um, which is model driven, so we do have um, semantic understanding of each individual piece of data that is stored there. It provides us with uh, state compression, so if you overwrite something in the config, um, applications usually do, uh, what they usually do is they, they subscribe to changes, and what the state compression does is that you don't get notified about events which are no, no longer um, needed because, say, the, the config got over it and, um, during the time then, uh, when the application either couldn't keep up or it was offline completely. Um, we also define the, RP, the, the ability to do RPCs, which is a simple call to a provider. We don't really care, or you as an application don't really care who provides the implementation of the RPC. It, it's just, um, um, it's something that, that the SAL takes care of um, really finding the, the implementation of the RPC for you, routing that request to, to, to that implementation and then routing the response back, uh, back to you. And then we've got the notifications which really are 
just just paying so of well something has happened you better look at something or uh, well openflow plugin uses it for to to model packets and this way um uh really we can we can um cover all sorts of applications not only in the networking world but in in other areas um i'm not sure well what those are but it's utilities it's power it's whatever i mean it's as long as you can write a data model uh, for it, you can write an uh, open daylight application uh, for it. Now, um, this essentially is what, what it looks like on, on a single node. Obviously, we, we do have the, the cluster data store and the cluster services, which provide seamless um, uh, replication and um, ability to, to, uh, for protocols on sitting on different nodes within a, uh, within a cluster to communicate the, uh, between themselves and provide either HA or scalability or, well, both. <laughs> so this is what we really shipped in beryllium. Um, and it is kind of usable, but there are certainly some, some things that are um, still not there and which we seek to address. So what's wrong with clustering in beryllium? Um, well, we've got a couple of bugs and a couple of corner cases. Um, the bugs are really the oversight kind, kind of thingy where um, the architecture really calls for RPCs. If you, if you sit on one node as an application and want to fire off an RPC to a, to, 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 to a consumer or rather to an implementation on the other node, it doesn't really work for all RPCs. It works only to, for routed RPCs, which is a misnomer because, well, routed RPCs are the RPCs that are tied to, to a particular node. Like if you have a connected open flow switch and you want to add a flow or invoke something on, on that switch, um, that is an RPC. Oh, that is a routed RPC. Whereas the global RPCs are those um, normal RPCs defined in Yang models, right? So there's a singleton uh, implementation, and it should be uh, able to sit anywhere in the cluster. But unfortunately, uh, our implementation doesn't really do that. So that's something that, that we'll need to get corrected. Also, the data tree change notifications are not global. And this is something of, um, of a disconnect between the architecture and the actual implementation and um, how they, because the core and the SAL APIs don't really talk about clustering. Clustering is something that is orthogonal to, to them. There are some overlaps and sometimes you ask yourself, well, if I, if I subscribe to this data tree and it happens to live on, on a different node, what do, what do I get? So the answer, if you use plain data tree change listeners, the answer is you won't get anything unless the, the shard leader happens to move your way, at which point you start getting things. And then when it moves, then maybe you're gonna get something, maybe not. Um, there's a cluster data tree change um, uh, listener uh, interface, which works this around uh, slightly, but it really means that you, you are using a different interface to indicate that your application is clustered enabled, whereas you, you shouldn't really be doing that. Um, the other part that does not quite work um, in Beryllium, there are um, problems you probably seen ask timeouts when the, the system gets un, un, under heavy load, um, at which point your pro, uh, application is probably shot and it, it will be restarted in short order um, simply because the, the front end of the cluster data store has no, no ability to, to retry operations on the back end when the back end is either overloaded and it cannot keep up or it, it fails over, then, then some, some of those operations may get lost. They will trigger an uh, ask timeout at which point the front end will just give up, report an error and expect the application to restart and hopefully recover. Um, addressing this actually um, turned out to be a major piece of rewrite um, in the model how, how the, the front end, which is what the applications use, and the back end, which is really raft actor um, and, and, and those shards um, which provide the data, 
communicate. Um, so we, we've done some work to, to address that. In Boron, we are targeting SR1 to really fix that. Um, the raft algorithm, well, it is pretty cool and it works, except our implementation has slight problems or had slight problems around um, uh, leader isolation. So if you had a, a, a three node cluster, for example, and uh, it was partitioned in a way where um, the, the, the leader got isolated from, from the two followers, then you could run up into all sorts of problems which could end up um, corrupting your data. Um, this, is, this is something that is covered in the uh, rough specification, but it's not explicitly called out. So there, there, there were some issues around that that we needed to identify, um, and Tom actually fixed them in, in, in Boron uh, once we really knew what, what was going on. And yeah, so, so that's one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And um, the final bit is um, essentially uh, revolves around when you do transactions across shards. So if you have a transaction open and you happen to write to two shards, then during that time, um, those two shards are driven through a three-phase commit um, protocol. As it turns out, our backend implementation is not completely correct. And the prepare and commit phases are done in one step which means that if a failure happens in that short time window, um, there is a probability that the, the front end and the back end will see different things. And yeah, the, the end result is that, that the application is incoherent and, and the actual observed committed state in the data tree is, is different what, from what the application saw. Um, the, uh, fixing of that actually requires quite a bit of surgery in, in the, in the backend implementation. So we will be addressing that in the next release, I guess. So um, the, pro um, the performance part. Well, yeah, well, performance is important for, for everybody. Um, we, we've done some improvements to, to um, again, improve things. As it turns out, our cluster data store is really strict, um, with, um, built with strict consistency, and there are there, there's a price to pay for it. And the, the way um, the beryllium system is integrated, you don't really get to, to pick which data um, gets stored in, in which database. I mean, there, there are use cases where we're plugging in Hadoop or Cassandra or some other data store um, would make sense because it's more performant, it can better integrate with the environment and operational requirements um, of the deployment. Unfortunately, that in, in the Beryllium deployment model, that really means that all of your data has to go to, to that persistent store. And um, that means that essentially all, all the validation that is done by the Open Daylight community is shot and you're on your own with your a particular data store implementation. So um, that is something that, that we set out to um, address with the ability to, to plug in different data stores. Um, it's been designed, I think, about a 18 months ago. Um, this really is, is something that we, we started actually implementing those, those APIs and those concept, concepts. Um, and the third part, is really um, cluster awareness for applications because the service activation model we, we've had um, didn't really take, take clustering into account. So if you configured um, your, your application instances, your southbound protocols, they all came up on all nodes of the cluster. Um, and if you had a replication going on, on on that data, they probably stamped all over itself and uh, themselves and started restarting. And they weren't really aware of whether they should run on one node or each node um, or what should they do. So that's one uh, thing that uh, we really needed to, to address and give applications the ability to actually decide, well, I just want to use clustering for HA, so what do I do to, to enable that? Um, we had some, some work done on, in, in OpenFlow to actually drive the 
the, the requirements as to what the application can do. And um, as, it, as it turned out, they, they really need a, a, just a very, very simple API to express that, that HA need. And we didn't really explicitly um, document how, how are you supposed to, to use clustering? How do you achieve HA for, for your application? So what we've done in Boron, aside from, well, the general improvements, um, in, inside cluster data store, we kind of um, reorganized the, the code a bit so, so that all, all state handling related to what should be in the data store um, is, is, is in one class, and that, that is talking to the, to the raft uh, actor implementation. So, so it gets notified when things get replicated, and it's, it's not really uh, spread ac uh, across three classes and different queues and um, all those things. And that is one key enabler to actually increasing performance in future and making sure that, that those sta state transitions um, happen in a predictable way. Um, leadership handover um, races, um, as I mentioned, there, there were a couple of um, uh, race conditions when, when you, for example, well, in, in CSIT fire, firewalled off one node, then, then so, some of the assumptions that the isolated leader was making an entity sh ownership service built on top of that, which essentially meant that once the partitioning, uh, the, the partition was healed, um, the, the system didn't recover and it made wrong decisions. It told, um, well, applications to move to, well, different states. I mean, to Tom could talk a, bit, uh, a long about, a uh, very long point about it. it was a, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was commit messages like three pages long describing what, what was happening. I mean, you, you, can, you can find all that in, in, in Git. Um, the, the other thing that is, um, from, from implement, implementation perspective, um, important is the ability to, to, to evolve um, what sort of data in what format we, we persist and replicate across the cluster. And around this, we didn't really have um, any, any knowledge of, well, we have an installed base of, of, of clusters um, and they may have been um, around since lithium for all we know. And they do have some, some rep, um, persisted state, which is some classes, serializable, yada, yada, yada. But we had no control over when the, those old, old um, data containers get upgraded. Um, and whether they, they got upgraded at all, which, which meant that we uh, had to carry a lot of um, old classes, um, protobuf messages, and what have you, and, and still keep them around in, in our code base just to provide that, that upgradability um, solution where, you, well, when you bring up a, a node, it has to recover its journal, and there may be old stuff lying there. We need to understand it. So in this release, we, we um, created a mechanism um, which allows for our code base to uh, explicitly say that um, we have recovered th this piece of data, but the journal holds it in, in a uh, superseded format, or rather in a format which was superseded, at which point the, the entire recovery mechanism detects this effect and if, if such a thing happened, we perform a full snapshot of the, of the journal, purging the, that's, uh, those old containers and replacing them with the latest and greatest format we have. And that way, we can really evolve our persistence and, and, and messaging patterns um, as we go, knowing that, well, if you, if you follow the, the, the upgrade path where you upgrade from one release to, to another, we don't have to carry the, the burden of those old classes for more than one release because, well, if, if, if you upgrade to that intermediate release, it will get upgraded and, and we can roll forward in a very controlled fashion. Um, yeah, and then the ask timeout thing. Um, it's tracked by buck 50 to 80. It's something like 80% done right now. Um, and we are seeking to, to deliver it in SR1. Unfortunately, it didn't make 
uh, the initial release because, well, all the other stuff that, that we did, and it turned out to be much more complicated than, than we um, originally thought. Of course, I mean, it's not even written, we still need to validate it because, well, switching, switching over to, to fresh code means that all those races, all those bugs will resurface because nobody writes perfect code and every, all, all code is buggy. So, so we, we really want to make sure that when we, when we flip the switch and go to, 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 to new messages, um, there, there will be no impact whatsoever on, on stability. Um, we also will be uh, providing this switch with um, a tunable parameter. So if anything goes wrong in, in the deployment, you can revert back to the old messages, leave with ask timeouts if you're not seeing them, or go back to, to that old way of doing things. Now, for uh, performance improvements. Uh, yep. Um, no, no, unfortunately, no, because um, it's, it's really just the internal uh, CDS format. So the question is whether the up upgrades really take care of evolving data models. Um, that is not sco in scope for clustering, really. It needs a generic solution. Um, we are working on making sure that, that we have enough data that we can do um, or, or we can run that, that uh, model to model translation. But for now, we just um, made sure that the internal data structures um, used by Cluster Data Store um, get, can, can be upgraded and are, in fact, upgraded as soon as we detect that we should be upgrading them. So, um, so for performance improvements, um, so currently the, the, the CDS has something that, that we call module sharding, where you can define a where a particular root level model, so either inventory or topology lives, um, which is fine if, if the applications are modeled that way. Unfortunately, it breaks down to when you need to have multiple topologies, for example, and you need to spread that load up. So for example, if you have an open flow topology and you have your BGP topology, then in, the, the, in this uh, sharding model, those two have to live in, in the same shard. You cannot really spread them. So um, coming in from the, the MD Solp, um, uh project, uh, we have the, the concept of the conceptual data tree, which allows us to really um, shard data, not only on the top level containers, but really in, at any place in, in, in that tree. Meaning that even if you have two topologies, you can say that, okay, I want to store um, the, the BGP topology in one shard and I want to store uh, the rest of the topologies or, or even another topology in a different shard. And those, those shards are um, then independent. You can move them around independently and really sp spread your load um, across cluster in a much better way than, than you were able to do, uh, do for now. Um, uh, up until now. And also we um, started to really define um, what the, the common, common models for um, doing, well, clustered applications, or really HA ap applications in this case, um, is how, how to use it, document it, give that simple service, which we call the singleton application service, um, and you, you can kind of just leverage that. It takes something like 15 lines of code to talk to that service, and um, automatically your application will become um, cluster aware in that it will not attempt to run on each node of the cluster, but the, the singleton application service um, will select a single node where that application will um, start. And if that node fails, it will choose another node and it will start um, the application there. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yeah. 
So operation, um, so um, we are still um, building up um, those capabilities. Um, currently, we are kind of mi midway in there, and this this slide uh, really really illustrates it. Um, so so the sharding layout is something that is local to to a particular node. So we do have a conceptual data tree, which is essentially all the data that is available on a particular node. Um, with the module-based shards, this really needed to be quite consistent across the cluster, right? So all data had to be available on all nodes, and you had to kind of replicate them um, in a symmetric way. Um, the conceptual data tree really does away um, with that model and really says that, okay, the, the, the scope of data available on one node is, um, is, is a local property of that node, um, some of the data uh, may be purely local to the node. It may be statistics pertaining to, well, runtime properties of plugins, available memory, you, you name it, like, like the op operation stuff. Um, and then there, there are parts of the tree which really are replicated across the cluster. And when you look at that particular subtree on one node and you look at it, um, at, at it on another node, you should see the, the same, um, same data. And that is really what, what the conceptual data tree is about. Um, and it is really, the implementation is just runtime. So we don't quite care um, from the impl implementation perspective how that sharding information get, gets populated. For, for module shards, we are writing a compatibility plugin which will read that, that old configuration and will push those shards into in, into the sharding service, and it it, it will lay lay laid out on each node the same. But um, we have also introduced um, MD cell level APIs, where um, as an application, even um, you can say that okay, I want to attach a, a shard implementation to this particular node, and for, from that perspective, it really doesn't matter what, where is it stored, right? It, it's the, it's the application which can be either the cluster manager or the, the CDS itself or really any old application which will say that, okay, um, attach a shard right over here on this node. Um, and if you, if you go into the mo more advanced mode where you really communicate like you, uh, like with the netconf topology which really supports active, active clustering, then, then you can say that, okay, I want to, um, attach this shard to, to multi, on multiple nodes to the same place and you get kind of, kind of consistency across the nodes. Um, it is a, um, quite, quite an advanced topic. I'm kind, kind of uh, struggling to, to explain it on, on a multi-dimensional thing because this is just a single node, right? If you, if you throw in five nodes, each of them can, can have, have a different layout and then um, it, it is a matter of implementation of each, each of those shards uh, as to how they're replicated. So, um, and th this really says that, well, so, so in this picture, we really have one default shard, um, which we're looking to, to have CDS for that actually, um, because, well, e people usually expect things to be consistent across cluster by default. Um, and then we have a couple more um, shards, which, which, as you can see, can be rooted at, at any place in the in in the in the tree, and you can actually um, nest them inside inside themselves, and they they have a well-defined API how how they can talk. So even though the 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 storage is completely different, if you're an application talking to the um, uh, to, to the data tree. You don't know where, where the data is stored. If you listen on, on the root, root of the tree, um, the, the shard implementations will um, synchronize and make sure that, that you really get the, entire, uh, the, the view of the entire data tree. If you write um, to, to a place, they will synchronize and, and coordinate to, to make sure that that, that change is written consistently across all of them and uh, persistent and replicated and what have you. Um, 
and obviously we can we can plug in different um, data store implementations into the same world. So um, whereas previously you had to inject a specific broker into an application, and that really defined your um, your, your view of the world. So you either had CDS or you had the IMDS. There there was no in between place where you, you could really say that, okay, this application stores things in, in a replicated manner and, and some other application wants to see part of that world but, but wants to store things only locally. There was no way to do that without resorting to injecting two data brokers at which point um, utter confusion occurs <laughs> because it's uh, something that is not really easy to reason about. Yep. Um, so, so historically, um, when we started building up the, the the data store, we had just one implementation, which was just in just an in-memory data store, not replicated, not anything. Then we superseded it with, with the cluster data store, um, which is replicated and persisted, but it still uses the the same in-memory um, Yang uh, data tree implementation. So when we talk about IMDS, we really mean the, the old thing, which doesn't replicate, which doesn't persist. It's just for transient data. Um, Implementation-wide, uh, wise, uh, both in-memory data store and the cluster data store uh, use the, 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 the same in-memory piece. So this is um, going a bit more into detail on how it really works. So um, currently, if you, if you have an application, you inject a data broker into it, it pretty much has to be the concurrent data broker, um, which talks to two instances of the distributed data store. Um, they are self-similar. Um, they, they differ only uh, uh, by configuration. Uh, so config uh, persists data, operational doesn't. Uh, they, they both uh, replicate, um, and you can obviously switch that replication off. And that is something that we call the front end, because um, that's what the application talk about uh, talk to. Um, and that is the piece of software which is um, tasked with, well, finding where, where the data really lives and talking to the back end which is really the shard implementation, and which is the, the entity that really stores the data and serves those requests. And then the backends obviously um, talk to each other, um, so, so they, they, they replicate stuff and, and provide discovery so the front end can, can locate it. Um, so, so these. So, so messaging inside cluster data store, um, the, the front and back end line really is ACA messages. So, so at that line, there, there is an uh, um, ACA actor system and calls within the front end are just uh, pure local Java calls. Calls from um, the front end to the back end are um, uh, ACA, ACA messages, really we're using ask pattern. That's where the, the ask pattern uh, or other ask timeouts are coming from. And then again, backend within an instance, it's pure, pure Java calls and talking to, to different shards is again um, shard, uh, ACA messages. So for Boron, we re-architected it a bit. So um, we, we now, instead of doing sharding inside the, the, the CDS, um, we, we have moved the, the, the concept of a shard into the MDSAL APIs so, so that really um, it's not just an implementation detail of a particular data store, but it's a concept. Um, each, each data store implementation can leverage, and it's really, at this point, it's not really a data store implementation, but it's a shard implementation. So the, 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 the individual um, implementations plug as shards into the, the conceptual data tree. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, so, so as you can see, um, the good question is uh, was whether they are um, in memory. As you can see, both shard, um, the, the CDS shard backend, and IMDS backends use Yang Data API Data Tree as their internal implementation to to actually achieve those, those operations and realize them and perform um, model consistency uh, enforcement. Um, the, the, the major difference here is that obviously you can have um, two implementations concurrently. Um, there's, well, three exclamation marks because um, while the um, CDS, well, we, we call it node agent here because it's omnipresent, it's on every node, uh, but it really is the, the shard manager and it's related functionality. It contains the, the sharding layout. We don't have an equivalent component in the in-memory data store. In fact, we are still designing and, and kind of thinking about what, what the requirements are, whether to store it in, in configuration files or do something similar to what CDS does, where, where it uses ACA persistence, or what, what really should be the um, um, functionality and how those two agents, because, because that really becomes also an agent, um, what, what the interactions between them are. If you define um, a, a shard to be in memory and CDS at the same time, what should happen? Um, we, we don't really have good answers right now, but I, I think we're gonna figure that out in, in uh, Carbon. So that, this is essentially the same picture. Um, we did some performance testing around um, what this is going to, to give us. Um, one thing that, that um, CDS has to do for each and every operation you perform, so, so you, you open a transaction and then you start pushing the data into it or reading from it. Um, so for each read, each write, each, each, each merge, um, CDS has to figure out which shard um, is, is the, um, uh, storage engine which, which really um, uh, maintains it. And this gets kind, kind of quite slow, not in the default single node uh, scenario or where, where you have only the default shard, but as soon as you have a couple of shards, uh, that is something that you start really feeling that every time you do an operation, you really have to go through that instance identifier, look at the first element, then look at the sharding table, um, then figure out, okay, this is a new shard, that, I, that this transaction is talking to, or is it something that we are already talking to, um, and redirect accordingly. So um, to address this, we created the producer consumer APIs where you create a consumer, which is, or rather a producer, which is um, the equivalent of a um, transaction chain. And when, when you're creating it, you, you give it the, the apex in, in the tree. Um, which allows us to do um, quick quick match to, to a particular shard which hosts the data, essentially meaning that even though you have a, a rich topology of shards, um, if a particular application is the only talking ever going to talk to one shard, we perform that binding at, at, at application startup and we don't have to perform uh, lookups for, for each operation which speeds up um, processing on the front end and leads to the um, application, not, uh, application thread not, not being burdened by, by that. Okay, um, Jan? Wanna talk, talk about this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so we um, uh, really have, um, uh, two, two sets of tests where we start, uh, where we either have a single threaded application talking to a num number of shards. So, um, and we've got uh, test results for one, two, four, eight, and 16 shards um, on Jan's um, Mac. And um, es essentially what, what the single producer um, does is it pre-creates a set of, I think, well, a tunable set of items inside the list. Uh, we tested it with up to a million. And what it does, it, it goes in and um, 
put those items e either into one shard or in a round robin fashion across multiple shards. So, um, and that really shows us how a single application thread can really uh, load the, the, the backend threads which service each of, each of those shards. Um, we, as an alternative, we have a multi-producer uh, multi test where we actually have um, uh, multiple threads, each talking to, to a single shard, and then you can see um, if you have, um, say, two threads feeding four shards, uh, how, how does that dynamic really work? Yeah. So, and uh, we hook a, um, so, so we also have a tunable number of listeners attached to, to each of those shards. Um, we've tested with 0, 1, 10, and 100 listeners because, as it turns out, having listeners attached to the data and actually having a microservice pipeline really changes the dy dynamics of how, how, how the data store performs. Um, obviously, we do have some statistics going on, and those are done by chain chaining on the commit futures you get from when you submit um, a transaction. Yep. Yep, that still holds. And this takes that limitation away? Uh, no, we, we, can, we cannot really take that limitation away because, um, so, so j I'll just repeat the question. The, um, the, the, the guideline, and it really is standing that you should avoid um, performing um, save rights to multiple shards in a single transaction. Um, and the reason for that is that um, the, the API requirement for, for the data broker API is that either all of that transaction succeeds or all, all, all of it fails. So um, what happens, and I'll go back in the slides if I can, is that say, say you have a transaction going across config and operational. We don't have to have many shards. Those, those, those will work fine as an, as an example. So if, if you do that, um, automatically, um, the, the procedures to, to, to commit to shard one and shard two, really, um, become a part of three-phase commit. So you have to have end-to-end -end, um, messages going on from the concurrent data broker to shard and, and back. So instead of being able to commit that, that transaction in a single message, you have to expand three messages to really commit it. And you have to pay um, six round trips um, to, to each shard to achieve that. That obviously makes the latency of, of, of that thing mu much higher. And also, there's much, much more processing involved. So that is something that is still, still, still very true, because the, this is something that happens on, on, the, uh, on the front end. Even with the dynamic sharding, when you have um, a, a top-level shard, you write something in there, and part of it overflows into a child shard. They will internally execute three-phase commit to, to affect the same thing. So yeah, the, the, the guideline still holds. Please write to a single shard at a time. Um, don't make the, the system um, go through all the, these hoops to keep the consistency there. Uh, well, they, they are not nested. So, so um, in each transaction, um, yeah. So, so while the worker um, can be touching more shards, um, it, it doesn't touch them in, in a single transaction. So what it does, it opens a transaction to, to one shard. It writes a, a, an item, and it submits the transaction. Then it moves to, to, the, uh, to another shard. It opens a transaction, writes a single item, and uh, submits it, and it goes in, in a round robin fashion. It doesn't open one transaction across those shards and, and write and, um, concurrently, because that, yeah, that, th those numbers would be quite, quite a bit different. So and these are really the, the numbers that, that we've got. Um, uh, as you can see, um, the, the variance um, 
really becomes interesting when, when we have 100 listeners, when it becomes v very interesting and we get a thundering herd problem because, well, every time we write something, um, we end up waking 100 threads. And um, as the number of shards exceeds the number of physical, um, or rather a number of cores, that, that, that thundering herd becomes an, an, an um, unmanageable problem. So, um, and what this does, um, I'm sorry, I need to get. Yeah, um, so, so and these, these results really, really show us that the cost of um, creating a transaction is quite high on, on the front end. So as you can see, with, with a single driver thread, um, we get quite high numbers of transactions uh, when, when talking to a single shard. But as, as soon as we, we add more shards, that single thread is not able to, to keep them busy. And our transaction rate goes down um, because it gets dominated by the setup time of creating the transaction and then uh, waking those, those backend threads up, which weren't busy, so they went to sleep while uh, the driver thread uh, was talking to other shards. So, so it really becomes um, a, an issue of, of scheduling those backend threads um, rather than, well, um, making them do uh, useful work. Now, if we do multiple listeners, and this is really one to one, so we have a a driver one driver thread per shard. You can see that we we pretty much get linear performance uh, Im improvements. So if you have four shards and you have four application threads and they don't uh, really need to synchronize, they are concurrently and the, the scaling is pretty much linear. As long as there's a reasonable no number of listeners present, if there's a hundred, again, the, those uh, threat scheduling issues um, uh, get in the way. But what, what is interesting that they, even though they dip heavily, um, the, um, the, the, the notification, the delivery of notifications actually causes some, some amount of um, overhead on the backend threads. So as you increase the numbers and um, in increase the number of, of shards, what will happen is that the backend threads cannot really keep up with the frontend threads. And that's where the um, uh, transaction compression, um, similar to what the ping pong data broker does, so it reuses the, the same transaction, the same backend transaction for multiple frontend um, transactions kicks in. And while the, the latency of individual transactions is the same, we stop paying the, that upfront cost of creating a transaction and, and the throughput goes up again. So, oops. Are you testing the yes, benchmark version? Um, some of them are in DS benchmark. Um, actually, they are in core tutorials. There's a okay. um, single simple shard simple test or something like that. Now if we compare that to, to plain CDS, um, the, 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 the slowdown is, is, well, this is what we get normally. So for, for single node, we, we get the, the same performance. Um, but as we move to, to having to replicate and persist the data, the, the performance goes um, down by 60%. And we're, if we're actually um, executing those tests on the follower, so, so all of those operations have to go through serialization, have to go to the leader, and then get replicated, the, the performance really goes down to something like 15% of what they can do. Well, what, what you can do when you're co-located, you don't replicate, and um, you, you really are on, on the fast path. So the, these benchmarks really showed, um, have showed us um, how, the, how the system really behaves under load, and what, what the, the individual costs are 
in the implementation. So again, small transactions which, which put a single leaf in are something that should be avoided. So perform your operations in logical batches, which makes sense for the application. Um, and that really, well, was really shown when, he, when we had really two backend threads um, working on a workload generated by, by a single thread. That single thread just couldn't keep up. Um, as, as noted, and, and you can see this also in, in CDS, um, is that as, as the, the latency increases, um, the, the ping pong data broker batching becomes more and more effective. So you start, even though you have small front end operations, um, they, they will get batched into, into larger transactions on the back end. And as the back end stops keeping up, they will get larger and larger, eventually becoming the, the uh, working data set, which would be huge transactions. But that allows the, the back end to, to um, keep up, even in a bursty way, uh, with, with the, the, the demand created by the application. Um, yeah. Uh, listening across shards um, means heavy backend contention. So this is something that we observed in the benchmarks. Um, it's not really seen in the results, but but the traces we we have gotten during those rounds uh, show that. So so if you have 16 shards um, and you listen on the root of the tree, and you start writing into those 16 shards. Um, your, your data change listener will get hammered by 16 threads from each shard, and it needs to reconstruct well, what really went on, how, how the changes were applied. Um, the current implementation does that under a single lock, which means that we've got 16 threads racing for a single lock, which means um, heavy, heavy amount of uh, um, contention. Um, the takeaway from that is, is that aligning where you, where you listen to your data, with where, how that data is produced, is quite critical in, in, in streamlining that, that processing pipeline. And if, it's, if, if, you, if you don't listen across shards, so if you listen exactly on, on that chart where data is produced, things don't hit any locks, and it, it's really much, much faster. Um, and, and again, if what, th that uh, that um, contention ac actually means that the backend is progressing slow um, at a much slower rate because um, the data change uh, notification threads start exacting uh, exacting um, exerting uh, back pressure, which slows down the backend chart, which means that more batching will will occur on the front end, and it kind of kind of goes back again. The system becomes uh, uh, much more bursty. Um, it's not as smooth, but it still gets the work done. Um, yeah, and if you can, if you can collocate your applications with, with shards um, and, and really isolate them, it, re it, it really increases throughput. Um, for example, so, so if you have um, in CDS, you have a default shard, or in, in, sing, um, in this improved sharding, if you have two application threads, talking to, to, to the chart, they can overwhelm them, and you, you will get um, a lower throughput that, that would be uh, possible. Okay. Um, back to your uh, question, Tom. This is, this is a how to, to really run the benchmarks. So it's, uh, it's in core tutorials, uh, sharding simple. Um, yeah, and that's pretty, pretty much simple. You can actually drive this. Um, um, this benchmark through, uh, so it gets deployed in, into Open Daylight. You can trigger it through RESTConf, so you can use Yangman or a provided Python script, which does um, uh, need, need summarization of uh, w what went on. Not yet. <laughs> so, so, the, so, the, so Yes, um, so um, really the, the operational model, and this is something that we get with, with OpenFlow typically, right? Because um, each, each OpenFlow switch is, um, is its own entity, 
So, and it can move uh, around the, the cluster based on external connectivity. Um, uh, really, when, when designing this entire thing, we, we had that in mind. So essentially what you could do is have a shard for each switch and then move that, that shard leadership so you don't have to pay the penalty. Unfortunately, we ran out of time in defining that um, please move the shard leader to this producer API. And that's something that, that we want to address either in SR1, um, more likely in carbon. Because up until now, the, the MD cell didn't, re it, it still doesn't really have the concept of, of how the cluster is laid out. But with the producer consumer APIs, it really um, gives us the, the connection. So if you have a producer, it, it has a connection to the, to the shard because it's not like an open transaction which can write the world. It, it is a, a, a transaction chain which has a primary um, counterpart on the back end. So you, you really can open a conversation be, between um, that particular top level shard that you're talking to in your application. And there's obviously an, a, uh, a way to, to create APIs where given, uh, given a producer, you can ask for more control, which is really tied to the implementation. Yep. So um, everything that, that worked up until now still works. Um, we, aside from, from this um, uh, performance stuff, uh, benchmarks, uh, we have not updated the, the documentation yet. We're still working on the implementation. Yeah, but we'll, we will be looking at, uh, at it. <coughs> yep. Not, not right now. Um, so, so there, there is a, a hacky way to do it because each. Right. Um, yeah, that, that is one possibility. The, the problem is that, that um, entity ownership service, um, well, entities, um, are not connected in, 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 in any way to, to really the shard layout. So we would have to extend either the entity ownership API so that applications can kind, kind of say that, okay, I'm talking to this shard or really this instance identifier as the root, or uh, some smarts would, would have to be in place to, to, to make that connection. Currently don't have one. Um, a hacky way of achieving this is talking to the JMX interface where you do have um, the information about shards and, and leadership exposed. But that really is not something that should be used in normal applications. So that, that's exactly the area that, that we will be uh, working towards. Yep. So, so the question is whether we have to replicate all data to all nodes. And the simple answer is no, we don't have to. Because um, um, the, so, so even if, if you have two, uh, 12 nodes, you don't have to run uh, shard members on, on all of the, those nodes, right? So if you have 12 nodes, you can run um, uh, shards um, on five of them, for example. And then the, the other seven will, will access them remotely. So, so you, you, you don't have to replicate. It's the request, the request lands upon a node that doesn't contain the shard. The shard yep. manager is the one that takes care of routing it, right? Right. So, if I'm willing to find the information of who are all the members of the shard, because it doesn't even, it is not even a member of the shard. Okay. Um, Tom, you, you probably know the answer to that. Um, but shard, uh, shard manager actually does some sort of discovery. I don't, I don't yes, remember. Yeah. It. <laughs> it will. It'll go out to the other shard managers and say, do you know about the shard? Yeah. Exactly. Even though all the peers, uh, okay, so you know about all the peers for me, but if I don't know who the shard is, 
because I am not a part of that shard. No, it flies. It asks other shard managers, do you know about this shard? Okay. So, 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 so your local shard manager knows about all shard managers are, are running in the cluster. And if it doesn't find that information locally, it will, it will recursively, or rather, it will talk to, to all of them and ask each of them whether they know about the shard. And, and it will pull, pull that information. Thank, thanks, Sam. OK, we, got, we are officially over time now. And we have a couple of more slides to go. I think it's something like six or seven. Um, so this is really talking about the um, singleton service. Um, so so um, usually what, what, we, what we get is that a set of applications, which we call an application group, talk to a limited amount of, of, of data, and they keep them in, um, in, in a couple of shards, right? And, and these are really replicated across nodes. And the question is, where, where do you activate these, um, these applications? With the config subsystem and also with, with Blueprint, what you get is that once the node boots up, it will start all, all the local applications. Since uh, we can assume that those shards are replicated, they will trample it over each other, um, overwrite each other's data, and they will get data dependency conflicts and promptly shut down as, um, as a result of that. Um, entity ownership um, service gives us the ability to essentially um, move leaders around. So if you register on each node, um, you, you can get voted to, to be the leader. The problem with that is it doesn't really um, take into account the fact that it may take some time for application to shut down. Um, so even though you get um, voted a new leader, the older leader may not have shut down. It may still be processing data. It still may, it may still be writing into the data store. And if you um, start up immediately, you will again trample all over that place and, and bad things happen. So in order to, um, to support that, this, the singleton service really takes this into account. Um, it uses internally entity ownership service and a neat hack that um, Václav has come up with, which is, uh, which is where um, you get really two entities. One guards the uh, who should the leader be, and the other entity is just a synchronization thing between the past leader and the new leader, and you kind of get, get the weights there. Um, since the API is very easy to use, it, it is used all over the place. So um, instead of having uh, just OpenFlow plugin work with it, we've got FRM, OpenFlow plugin, GBP, and list flow mapping working with it. Um, actually, this includes also, I think it's, it is in Boron, and, and if not, it's going to be in SR1, um, also includes BGP. So it's really easy to use. It takes something like, I don't know, 15 or 20 lines of code to integrate. Um, Jan? Do you have the demo ready? Oh, we, we ran out of time. Oh, so yeah. So this is the demo application, the supposed demo. Yeah. Um, so so the, the slides will be posted. There, there's a um, um, steps steps to run it. I will just quickly run for um, as as a as a uh, teaser for DDF. What we really want to do is in in carbon continue the, the bug fixing. Uh, we really want to finish the MD cell mi migration because currently we've got something like three different APIs at the DOM layer, same for binding. Um, and it's really confusing to know who is implementing what and what should the applications do. Um, the guides have not been updated yet, so, so it's a um, thing that we need to do on uh, during the entire release. Um, in, inside CDS, we really do want to do asynchronous, uh, persistent, or, and, and replication. Um, as you've seen in the benchmark, in the benchmarks, the, the latency it takes for, for transactions to commit is really hurting application performance. We, our throughput is dominated by, by latency. We want to fix that. Um, as I noted, um, for, we really just have dynamic shards for IMDS. 
Uh, we do have prototype patches for CDS, but those need to be finalized. So it's going to land either in one of the SRs or definitely in, in Carbon. We want to clean up the, the data broker and to, to improve um, uh, replication performance, we want to introduce dormant CDS replicas, which really don't do all the heavy lifting uh, the, the normal live replicas do, but just, just keep the journal replicated. And we, yeah, um, as, as we not, um, ask, uh, we, we want to introduce that API to move shared leadership um, towards applications. Yep, and that's it. Thank you. Because the core and the SAL APIs don't really talk about clustering. Clustering is something that is orthogonal to, to them. There are some overlaps. And sometimes you ask yourself, well, if I, if I subscribe to this data tree and it happens to live on, on a different node, what do, what do I get? So the answer, if you use plain data tree change listeners, the answer is you won't get anything unless the, the shard leader happens to move your way, at which point you start getting things. And then when it moves, then maybe you're going to get something, maybe not. Um, there's a cluster data tree change um, uh, listener uh, interface which works this around uh, slightly, but it really means that you, you are using a different interface to indicate that your application is clustered enabled, wh whereas you, you shouldn't really be doing that. Um, the other part that does not quite work um, in Beryllium, there are um, problems you probably seen ask timeouts when the, the system gets un, un, under heavy load, um, at which point your pro, uh, application is probably shot and it, it will be restarted in short order um, simply because the, the front end of the cluster data store has no, no ability to, to retry operations on the back end when the back end is either overloaded and it cannot keep up or it, it fails over then, then some, some of those operations may get lost. They will trigger an uh, ask timeout, at which point the front end will just give up, report an error, and expect the application to restart and hopefully recover. Um, addressing this actually um, turned out to be a major piece of rewrite um, in the model, how, how the different protocol plugins and then give services to all those applications and what have you. Um, this is something that we realized early on when we started doing Open Daylight. Um, and we kind of evolved it to uh, a, a different architecture where really the uh, service abstraction is, lies really with, with the applications and with the plugins. And the model-driven SAL really just provides the plumbing where, where you can um, pull your, your individual plugins and based on the data models um, and, and the interactions they model, you can kind of integrate the system so, so you can have uh, really um, parts of the controller which solve a particular function and you can have, uh, and you can have uh, the, these kind of islands, right? So I don't have to define um, in, in the core what is it that OpenFlow can do? What is it that NetConf can do? What is it that BGP does? I don't have to uh, abstract it out to, well, what, what really is the service? But I can rather define the data model for, for that particular problem domain. And then the individual plugins, be it southbound protocols, be it applications, be it whatever really service it is, um, use that. Um, of the Sorry. Um, and, and the SAL really provides just uh, the means to communicate, which are um, three th uh, things really. The concept of a, of a data store, um, which is model driven, so we do have um, semantic understanding of each individual piece of data that is stored there. It provides us with uh, state compression, so if you overwrite something in the config, um, applications usually do, uh, what they usually do is they, they subscribe to changes and what the state compression does is that you don't get notified about events which are no, no longer um, needed because say the, the config got overwritten um, 
during the time when, uh, when the application either couldn't keep up or it was offline completely. Um, we also defined the, RP, the, the ability to do RPCs, which is a simple call to a provider. We don't really care, or you as an application don't really care who provides the implementation of the RPC. It, it's just, um, um, it's something that, that the SOL takes care of um, really finding the, the implementation of the RPC for you, routing that request to, to, to that implementation and then routing the response back, uh, back to you. And then we've got the notifications which really are just, just pings of, of, well, something has happened, you better look at something or, uh, well, OpenFlow plugin uses it for, to, to model packets. And this way, um, uh, really, we can, we can um, cover all sorts of applications, not only in the networking world, but in, in other areas. Um, I'm not sure what, what those are, but it's utilities, it's power, it's w whatever. I mean, it, it's, as long as you can write a data model uh, for it, you can write an uh, open daylight application uh, for it. Now, um, this essentially is what, what it looks like on, on a single node. Obviously, we, we do have the, the cluster data store and the cluster services, which provide seamless um, uh, replication and um, ability to, to... I guess we're ready to start. Um, Jan is unfortunately still compiling the demo, uh, which we'll see later in the presentation, so he'll be um, in, in, in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, I'll go for him uh, uh, till that time. Um, I'm Robert Varga. Um, some of you may know me um, as the uh, PTL of Yang Tools and um, a, a, a local guy on the mailing list. Um, uh, and I'll update you what we've done in Boron and what the, the plans around, well, clustering, MDSAL, the overall architecture, and wh where is it that we want to take um, um, open daylight infrastructure in, in the coming releases. Um, feel free to jump in at, at, at any time with any questions. We've got plenty of time. A couple of slides may be too little, so uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, so I'll start off with a bit, bit of architecture. Um, essentially, what, what does really make open daylight different? Um, I, I guess you've seen this, this uh, slide a couple of times before. Essentially, usually what you get from a controller is some sort of a service abstraction layer which really defines the APIs for southbound plugins and, and northbound plugins and then um, applications really and what, what sort of northbound APIs are exposed. Um, as it turns out, usually when you start off with this sort of ab um, uh, abstraction, the, the, the architectural bottom, um, bottleneck becomes the uh, SAL um, because it has to define the normalized um, data model and the model of interactions for, to cover all those different network elements, all those different uh, for protocols on sitting on different nodes within a, uh, within a cluster to communicate the, uh, between themselves and provide either HA or scalability or, well, both. <laughs> so this is what we really shipped in Beryllium. Um, and it is kind of usable, but there are certainly some, some things that are um, still not there and which we seek to address. So what's wrong with clustering in Beryllium? Um, well, we've got a couple of bugs and a couple of corner cases. Um, the bugs are really the oversight kind, kind of thingy where um, the architecture really calls for RPCs. If you, if you sit on one node as an application and want to fire off an RPC to a, to, 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 to a consumer or rather to an implementation on the other node, it doesn't really work for all RPCs. It works only to, for routed RPCs, which is a misnomer because, well, routed RPCs are the RPCs that are tied to, to a particular node, like if you have a connected open flow switch and you want to add a flow or invoke something on that switch, uh, 
um, that is an RPC, uh, that is a routed RPC. Whereas the global RPCs are those um, normal RPCs defined in the Yang models, right? So there's a singleton uh, implementation, and it should be uh, able to sit anywhere in the cluster. But unfortunately, uh, our implementation doesn't really do that. So that's something that, that we'll need to get corrected. Also, the data tree change notifications are not global. And this is something of, um, of a disconnect between the architecture and the actual implementation and um, how they 